And I remember I spoke to one of my uncles afterwards who'd had a heart attack in the past. And he said, the problem is, Paul, those machines can only tell if you're having a heart attack whilst you're strapped up to them. So you might have had a heart attack in the past and you just don't know. And at that moment, I remember thinking something needs to change. And it's, it's, it's interesting whenever I talk to people throughout the world now, whenever people have sort of, not that that was, I wouldn't describe that as a near death experience, but a, a moment where your mortality comes into question and all of a sudden i think as youngsters we all think we're we're immortal and it's only as you get older you start to realize you're not and when something like that happens all of a sudden it changes everything so i can put that that was the first step towards me changing my life basically and thinking and it's important for me to be grateful for just the very basic thing in life of being alive and not taking for granted what we are given as a gift Thank you, thank you from my heart, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, thank you from my heart, from the bottom of my heart. Stay connected to gratitude. Hit the follow button right now and join thousands of listeners tuning in each week. We're the Gratitude Seekers. Come join us. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. Our guest today is an author, entrepreneur, coach, and former corporate lawyer. He used to be a corporate lawyer, but found himself depressed and suicidal, despite having achieved everything society tells us we need to be happy. He took the brave decision to start again and began work to discover the root cause of his feelings of unfulfillment and dissatisfaction. Paul, Paul Cope, our guest today, has done extensive research into those root feelings and part of that includes how we work in relationships with other people. He works closely closely with people suffering from a variety of mental illnesses such as ADHD, anxiety, depression, and now he is here with us to talk about himself, about gratitude, and um, the book that just um, came out. Paul, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. Thanks for having me, George, and happy to be here. So, uh, getting to the first part that I mentioned, uh, tell us a little bit about you, about your story. So as with, as with all of us, I think it's a long story. So I'll tell you the short version. I, I basically, <laughs> I, just, I knew when I was three years old that I wanted to be a lawyer. And it, it started off with a, with a story in, in my dad's car when I was three. And I, I used to love cars when I was little. I used to, I used to have a, a bucket at my house full of, full of those little cars and I'd play with them every day. And one day we were in, in my dad's car and a, and a, black Porsche pulled up alongside us at the traffic light. And I said to my dad, whose is that car? And he said, it's our lawyers. And I said, I want to be a lawyer then. And, and off the back of that story, that story, because I was, I'm from a very normal working class family in Liverpool in the UK. And so my family was very happy to hear that their, their son wanted to be a lawyer. And I was, I'd be the first person in the family to go to university. And so obviously this was met with great joy and pleasure from the whole family and I used to my parents used to say to me to when we'd be at a party or anything like that tell everybody what what you want to be and I'd say I want to be a lawyer and everyone would cheer and be happy so from a very young age I was like well this sounds like a good idea and I just went through my entire life I was one of those people in school who other people were frustrated by because I always knew what I wanted to be 
So other people would say to me, I wish I knew what I wanted to be. And I say, well, I, I've got this sorted. And it, that led me all the way through life, basically through university to law school, to qualifying to work for some of the biggest and best law firms in the world. And I, I had a number of occasions along the way where I questioned it and I thought, I, I remember in, in university, they, a, a law firm sent in someone to talk to us, to tell us how to become a lawyer after our degree. And they said, you'll be asked a question in your interview about why you want to be a lawyer. And I remember th I sat there and thought, oh, that's easy. I, I know. I've always wanted to be a lawyer. And the guy, st <laughs> I'll never forget this moment. The guy paused and said, but there's one answer we won't accept. He said, we won't accept the answer that you've always wanted to be one. You've got to tell us why you want to be one. Mm -hmm. And I, I vividly remember it was like someone hit me across the face with a bat because I, I went home that day and I was like, I don't know why. And when I started to unpick this story, this factors into a lot of the work I do with people now about stories we tell ourselves and our childhood and the programming we get. My story was basically, I saw a nice car. And if that day my dad had said to me, that black Porsche is owned by a doctor, I'd have said I wanted to be a doctor. If he'd have said to me, it's owned by someone who runs an engineering company. I'd have said, I want to be in, I want to own an engineering company. I didn't know what a lawyer was. I didn't know what the job was, but so this, but this story just followed me through life and different things happened. And I, so I ended up carry on down the path, went to, as I say, work for some of the biggest and best law firms in the world at 29, set up my own company, set up my own law firm. And I just reached a point in my mid thirties where I realized not only did I not enjoy it, but I was completely depressed. I had to the outside world. I had everything that everybody says you should want. I had a, a business with a big flash office in a city center. I owned a beautiful city center apartment. I owned multiple investment properties. I made a lot of money. I drove a nice car. I married a beautiful woman. And at the moment when I would say society thought I was at the peak of doing so well, I was at my most depressed and suicidal. I, I was planning on how to end my own life. And I just reached a point where I thought there must be more to life than this and decided to rip it all down and start again. Wow. That's amazing. Like how, how clear you are about, uh, all of, uh, all of these things and, um, the, how they evolved in in your life and it it's actually I, I really appreciate your vulnerability and you sharing all of this with us and just this uh this whole perspective like uh what we we see on the outside and what's happening on the inside can be such a such a great difference if we don't know the whole story and um yeah, I think this is this is fascinating, at least for me. I'm sure for our listeners as well. Um, but I'm I'm curious on your journey. Um, was there a moment when you discovered gratitude, like that personal experience of of gratitude, not just the, the concept, the idea, but actually uh, something really personal that you experience with uh, not just with your mind but also with your heart oh, I've so so many experiences um, it was interesting when I was thinking about this coming onto your show that it's hard to, to pinpoint individual things when so many things have happened in your life over an, a long period of time but there was one story that, that stands out at me and it was it was when I was in the middle of running my own law firm and I'd, I'd set up another company an online company and I was doing property development so I was working extremely hard so all of the things that lots of the personal development world will tell you to do lots of lots of drive and um, lots of long hours and you know working 100 hours a week and not sleeping very much and I remember once this this was must have been when I was about 30 31, 32 years old, and I started to get a pain down my left arm, and it and it was there for consistently for weeks and weeks. And I was going to a, I'm a football fan, and I was going to a football match one day, and I mentioned it to two of my friends. I said, "God, this my left arm's been been in pain for weeks," 
And they both said to me, you need to go to the doctors. And it, I always say to people, if I don't know what, whether it's the same in Romania, but in, in Britain, male friendships tend not to be very, we, we tend not to be very nice to each other a lot of the time. They're not, when people show, when people show um, compassion towards each other, you know there's something to worry about because yeah. <laughs> we, most of our life is spent laughing at each other and telling jokes. And so we don't tend to talk about things like health issues and things like that. So when, when a male friend says to you, you need to go to the doctors, it's something to worry about. And I, I remember when I went home and I phoned, we had like a non-emergency health number in the UK back then. And I phoned this, this lady and she answered and she always reminded me of an auntie of mine, very caring. And she said, what's the problem? And I said to her, um, I've had this pain down my left arm. It's nothing to worry about, but you know, I said I would check it out. My wife at the time wanted me to get it checked out. Um, and she said, how long have you had the pain for? And I said, it's probably about two months now. And she said to me, so for every day for two months, your left heart arm has been in pain. And I said, yeah. And she said, what type of pain? And I said, it was the difference, like sometimes numb, sometimes ting, like it tingles, sometimes pins and needles. And she said to me, okay, son, what I want you to do is I want you to go and wait by your front door and I'm going to send an ambulance to your apartment. Oh, nice. I'm going to take you straight to accident and emergency in the, in the hospital. And I said to her, whoa, whoa, you, I went, you don't need to do that. I went, this is not an emergency. I've had this pain for, for weeks. And she said to me, that's the problem, son. She said, this is really serious. You need to get to hospital. And at that moment, my wife came burst into the room and I convinced the lady on the phone she didn't need to send an ambulance. My wife could take me to the hospital. And I went to the accident and emergency unit in the city centre in Liverpool, which is usually really busy, full of people, you usually have to wait for hours to be seen. And I walked to the desk and I gave my details to the lady behind the desk. And she typed them into her computer and looked up at me. And obviously the lady I'd spoken to on the phone, I'd phoned her head. And she said to me, Paul, you need to go through this door to your left and completely bypass the waiting room, which had never happened to me before in oh my all my years on the planet. I walked through these swinging double doors to be greeted by a young doctor in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck, like, like you would see in a hospital drama on TV. And he walked me across to this bed with a machine full of all of these um, wires and clips. And he sat me on the bed and he Took, I took my top off and he strapped me up to this machine again like you would see in a hospital drama with all the sticky patches on your chest and your, on your arms. And they were, they were basically checking to see whether I had a heart attack or whether I was having a heart attack. And they did lots of tests and they said, There's no, you're, you're okay. They kept me in for a couple of hours and then they, they sent me away saying, you need to think about the lifestyle that you live in and the, you know, the amount of stress you're under. And I remember I spoke to one of my uncles afterwards who'd had a heart attack in the past. And he said, the problem is, Paul, those machines can only tell if you're having a heart attack whilst you're strapped up to them. So you might have had a heart attack in the past and you just don't know. And at that moment, I remember thinking something needs to change. And it's, it's, it's interesting whenever I talk to people throughout the world now, whenever people have sort of, not that that was, I wouldn't describe that as a near death experience, but a, a moment where, your mortality comes into question and all of a sudden i think as youngsters we all think we're all, we're immortal and it's only yeah. you get older you start to realize you're not and when something like that happens all of a sudden it changes everything so i can put that that was the first step towards me changing my life basically and thinking and it's important for me to be grateful for just the very basic thing in life of being alive and and not taking for granted what we are given as a gift wow i can only imagine how how it must have felt and um yeah the shock of finding something like this out when like you said we we think we're immortal we're invincible and yeah we, we realize that it's not actually quite like that and just the fact that we are alive still, especially in, in that particular situation in which you were in, is, is, is something that you can be grateful for and you need to be grateful for. And yeah, wow. 
that that's that's quite quite an experience. Hmm. And how do you define uh, gratitude? Like for yourself, how uh, what would be a, def a definition of of gratitude in your eyes? I think I think gratitude is all about being able to see being able to see the good in things, even when on the surface it might not appear that there's anything mm -hmm. good in them. To be able to see what, what benefit you've had from experiences in life, whether they happen to you now or happen to you in the past, um, that have been that yeah, that have benefited you. Because it's very easy for us to look at things that happen to us. And something I talk about a lot to my clients and, and in the new book is the idea that we, we meet a lot of our needs in life subconsciously. I talk a lot about human needs and the way our, our systems are, are built subconsciously to meet these needs a lot of the time. And one of the ways in which we do that is to, is to paint ourselves as the victim a lot of the time. And when things happen to us that on the surface appear to be negative, we can focus on, the, on that so-called negativity when actually for the most part some of the most some of the things that on the surface appear to be the most negative things that have happened in my life have, have actually in the long run been the most beneficial like i've learned far more from times of adversity and hardship than i ever learned from times of joy and happiness the joy and happiness times were lovely but they didn't teach me as much as the times where i was going through darkness and pain and it, so being able to see that and be, to be able to zoom out and, and over time train yourself that actually when you're in the moment even in in that moment of, of feeling pain or experiencing things that might or what people might think are negative to be able in that moment to say but think of what i'll benefit from this think of what will come next think of the experience i'm getting that's that's huge for me and that's that is fundamentally what gratitude is to me Giving a gift that supports someone dear to your heart can be a real blessing. Woohoo You made it very simple for you to offer a memorable gift that your loved one will surely cherish for the rest of their life. Help him or her feel appreciated and valued right now. They might need it more than you think. Go to georgianbenta.com slash woohoo or visit the link in the description to find out more. Wow. I love this perspective, and um, yeah, I, I just realized that that I didn't ask you how you are right now, from uh, this point of view, like from um, your health standpoint. Yeah, I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. Um, it, it part of when I change, I change my life now. Probably, I started making changes quite a few years ago, but for the past three or four years, I've been working very hard i started working with a therapist and started working with coaches in different countries and learning from all corners of the globe and, and completely transformed my life including from a health perspective so yeah i've i've never felt better i was chatting so i'm 41 years old now and i was talking to someone the other day and one of my favorite things in life is that when, when i was younger i always looked young for my age so when people, if someone said to me when, when i, I was saying, feeling <laughs> So when I, let's say when I was 25, if someone said to me, how old are you? And I said to them, guess how old do you think I am? I'd, 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 I'd enjoy playing that game because they'd say 19, 20. And I'd be like, no, I'm 25. <laughs> and then when I got to this point of running my law firm and being the most stressed I'd ever been, I'd, I, I would say like 32 at the time in the, in the worst moment of this. And I'd say to someone, they'd say, how old are you? And I'd say, guess. And they'd say 40. 40 and i'd be like no wow. no i'm 32 <laughs> wow something's gone wrong here and and the best the way, best way to explain how much my life has improved is it's we've gone back to the other way now so when people ask me how old i am now and i say i'm 41 they'll often say to me wow you don't look 41 I thought you were in your 30s and i'm like oh thanks so yeah <laughs> I, feel, I feel feel better than ever oh that's wonderful i'm really glad to hear that and yeah i'm i'm sure that this this is the way we feel inside is very reflected, very much reflected in in how we look, we, how we're perceived by by other people. Um, but I, I would like us to go back in time and 
um, talk a little bit about our childhood and how um, the the moments when we we feel that our self worth is is low how how they affect our lives right now can you elaborate on this a little bit absolutely yeah this is i mean this is this is forms the root of all the work i do with people now and the when i was learning from all these different places and different people i i ultimately came to the conclusion that all of our problems in our adult life trace back to when we were children and to uh, experiences we had as children which the the general sort of um psychology world will talk about trauma and the trauma that we experienced as children and something that i found was i I had a really nice childhood i i don't like talking about trauma because i think to most of us trauma sounds like really big events that happened and when we talk about that most of us will say that that didn't happen to me i didn't have any traumatic events but what i learned over the years was that trauma to children is different to trauma to adults so when we look back at our childhood through adult eyes it doesn't often and don't obviously there are lots of people who can say yes i experienced severe trauma as a child but for the most part people will look back and say no no my life wasn't traumatic at all and I say, well, but because we're looking back with adult eyes, if you look back and look at it with child's eyes, most of life is traumatic for a child. One of my favorite examples to give is if you've ever seen a, a three-year-old who had an ice cream and dropped it on the floor and watch how they react to the fact that they've just dropped their ice cream on the floor, they will cry and scream as though it's the end of the world. <laughs> and, and I said to my, I was t- telling my dad, my dad's 75 now, so he's not really interested in this world at all. So I was I was explaining some of this to him and trying to t- explain it to him in a way he'd understand. And I told him this story about a child with their ice cream, and he said to me, "Yeah, but if, if you when you were a kid, if you dropped your ice cream, we'd just tell you we'd, we'd get you another one. It was fine." And I said to him, "Well, picture this then to try and put it in context of what what's happening to the kid." I went, "Let's say you came home from a hard day's work, and when you came home, your house had disappeared." your house is just gone it's not there anymore would you feel traumatized and he said absolutely of course i would i've got a very strong emotional attachment to the house and the things that are in it and i said to him what if i came up and put my hand on your back and said don't worry about it dad i'll buy you a new house and he said well that wouldn't make it better at all this house i wanted i said exactly (laughs) that's how children feel about their ice cream because to a three-year-old that ice cream is everything it's their entire world their emotional attachment to it is huge they don't know you can just get another ice cream (laughs) so when that ice cream falls on the floor to a child that can be a traumatic event and that's just a very basic example Mm -hmm. the work i go into is to help people understand how the things people say to us the behaviors we witness as children all lead to us experiencing small traumas and programming experiences as i call them which form who we are as people and one of the biggest things they teach us and this is nobody's fault this is just the way society has been built over the generations one of the things they teach us is that who we are naturally as people is not good enough and what that leads to is us having a sense of low self-worth or low self-esteem and that over the years develops in many many different ways and leads to that is effectively the root cause of all much bigger problems as we get older the problem is as we get as we become adults we get distracted by the symptoms so we start to focus on all of the things that are happening in our day-to-day lives thinking that's what the problem is and we try and solve the problem by focusing on the symptom whereas what i always say to people is no 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 we need to go right the way back and we go all the way back to childhood most of the time and we figure out all of these things we figure out what happened to us and why we develop the things we developed and then we can get into the actual root causes of how we transform things later on yeah that makes so much sense and um the way i see it is that we form a map of the world when we are children and an emotional map of the world and through these experiences through these um limitations like like with elephants when when they uh 
when they they use a rope when they uh, they are young elephants and when they grow big they they use the same rope and they basically don't try to to rip it off because they've learned this helplessness and the fact that um if if they try it won't work so they don't even try anymore mm-hmm. so definitely i think it's um it's something that's impacting all of us one way or another and um yeah i, I think it's before so actually while but also before um getting more in, into gratitude and into the practice of of gratitude i think we need to look uh, at these things as well because they are keeping us from um going forward and from uh, experiencing more in life yeah absolutely absolutely and it's one of my that because i'm a i'm a, a huge advocate of gratitude and um, the impact it can have on your life and something else I've realized as I've gone through the work that I've done on the flip side of the coin so something I talk about in the book is I'm sure you're a, 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 well I don't know what your view is on things like gratitude journals um, but I mm-hmm. guess you'd be a supporter of them and I think they're really good you know making it every day thinking about the ways in which we can be grateful for life and at the same time one of, when I talk about childhood one of the problems we have in childhood is we are taught that um, what people describe as negative emotions are not acceptable. So things like fear and anger and anxiety and jealousy and self-pity, we're taught subconsciously that these are not acceptable. And what that leads us to, because we know deep down instinctively that we feel these emotions, that leads to the feeling of we're not good enough because we think, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel these things. So if we jump straight to gratitude a lot of the time, it compounds this feeling of we're not good enough because if I feel in any moment, let's say I'm feeling sorry for myself and someone says to me, well, you should just be grateful for your life. I say, well, that's all well and good, but I already feel sorry for myself. So what do I do with that feeling? And if we jump straight to gratitude too quickly, what we're actually doing is still repressing and suppressing our real emotions, which is unhealthy. So there's a step to go through first, which is okay. Let me feel my real emotion first. There's nothing wrong with feeling sorry for yourself sometimes. There's nothing wrong with feeling jealous or angry or anxious. So let's recognize and accept and process that emotion. And once we've recognized and processed that emotion, then we can move to gratitude and think about all the ways um, in which we can be grateful for what's happened to us and for our lives. And, And I think that first step is often what's missing from a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense and I, I think it's it's a very important point. Like we have all of these things going on and um yeah, it's it's important to accept the fact that we are not perfect that we have emotions that are um negative and positive and um yeah, it's it's part of the um the colors of life we have a whole spectrum that we get to experience and yeah i think it's it's in somehow uh it's actually a gift and um it's something that we we are able to experience uh here on this earth so i also wanted to um to ask you i was very curious to to find out what are some of the things that you are grateful for right now? I'm guessing at, at, at a certain level, you were at least at some point um, quite gr- grateful for um, the external things that you are experiencing. Uh, the law firm, the, the car, the, um, the house, the investments. I'm curious, what are you grateful for right now? Yeah, so that's that's something that's changed hugely in my life. Is my my f- focus now is not on anything materialistic, really, or external. It's on more internal things and um, and and experiences. So 
going back to what we were saying earlier on, my um, I have a huge amount of gratitude for all of the pain I've experienced in my life and the 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 difficult times and health issues. I had I've had chronic health issues as well as that that sort of suspected heart attack story I told you before. And what I realized a few years ago, and I still see now, and especially with the book I've just written, the I would not be able to do what I do now. My life now would not look the way it looks without the pain I'd been through in the past, without having experienced all of those things, without having changed my own life. I wouldn't be able to help other people now the way I do. And it's something I am incredibly grateful for, which supports the, the point I was saying to you before about my, it ties in perfectly with my definition of gratitude, because if my life had just been lovely up to this point and full of joy and love and happiness and, and no difficult times, that would be lovely, but I would not be able to help people the way I can help people. And it's a, it's a very humbling and privileged position to be in, to be able to help other people to change their lives as a result of the difficult times you've had in your own life. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I, another thing that I, I think it's, it's quite important is the ability to be empathic with uh, the pain or the things that other people are going through. If you haven't experienced these kinds of things, you, you really can't, uh, understand can't feel for other people and, and understand what they're going through and i think that's that's an important part of being human and of um, making an impact in the world so uh, we're nearing the end of our time together and um, i want i want us to, to talk a little bit about your book it has a really bold title and um, yeah firstly let us know a little bit about the book and afterwards where can our audience get it yeah so you're absolutely right about the title it's it so <laughs> for the people listening it's, it's called how to solve any problem in life the root causes of, of everything and the, the title actually came about because i i'd started writing it i was in spain last year in a, in a co-living house and one of the things was uh if you, you know you're in this house and everybody contributes to the community and someone said to me well what could you contribute and i said well i could talk about the things i coach people on around the world and they said to me, what would you call the session if you had to call it something? It needs a name. And just off the top of my head, I said, how to solve any problem in life. And everybody <laughs> stopped. <laughs> everybody stopped and looked at me and said, that's a bold claim. And I, just, I started laughing and said, that's just what came to me. And it, it's true. It's, my belief about this work is that all of our problems come down to the same root causes. And if we forget what the problem is, and we don't get distracted by it, and instead we go to the root causes, what you find is the problems disappear. And um, so I, what the book is effectively is me taking people through the entire experience that they would go through if I was coaching them one-on-one, -on -one. but I can only coach a few people at a time and it's quite expensive to do. So I wanted to get the information because I think it's so powerful. I wanted to get this information out to many people as I possibly could for as low a cost as possible. Um, because I, I often think people, I, I love superhero movies and, and I often say to people, if I, if I have a superpower, I think I'd love it to be being able to fly or you know, shoot laser beams out my eyes. But what, what it looks like <laughs> I've ended up with is the ability to take a lot of complex information and to explain it to other people in a way that makes sense. And I used to be able to do this as a lawyer. I, would, I was renowned among my clients for being able to jump into a very complex deal, break it down into very simple terms, and then make sure everybody understands it. And that's something I like to do with this, because in, I think in the psychology world and the personal development world, often there's lots of very complicated stuff that even as a former lawyer, I'll be reading things and think, God, this is, this is so powerful and so important, but the way the person is explaining it is too complicated. They're using the words they use are too big. It's too boring. It needs to be more engaging. It needs to be more fun. So what I've done over the years is bring all of this stuff together and package it in a way that makes sense to more people. And the people I work with on a coaching basis, that's something they 
feedback to me is it it makes sense to them in a way that it hasn't made sense to them before presented in a different way with a different approach and different ways to think about similar topics so that's what the book does it, it takes people right the way through basically we the first phase is understanding who we really are stripping away all of the the human we've been built to be by other people and then the next phase is to transform and figure out how to transform into who we really want to be and who we're really meant to be and the last part of the book to to back up the uh the title the bold title is is i talk about some very big things in life so things like um love in relationships uh, healing illnesses changing the world and show how the principles in the book can be used to take on these really big topics which is an example of how basically they can be used for any any problem you have in life i can show you how it all comes back to the same thing that's wonderful i i love your perspective and i love how how bold it is and uh, yeah i i think too that um when we find the root of the problems it's easy to to find the solution and to um to make it into a, a an opportunity basically so uh where can our audience find your book so it's on at the moment it's available on amazon all around the world uh, in paperback kindle and will be on audible so audiobook in the next week or so um they can also, if they would like to read, I give away the first four chapters to fr for free. As I say, I'd like to get this to as many people as possible. So I give away the first four chapters to f for free through my website. Um, they can read it or listen to it, no strings attached. And if they don't like it, they can just unsubscribe from my mailing list, no questions asked. Uh, and the, the whole idea is people can, can sample it before they decide whether to, to spend their hard-earned money on it or to read spend the time reading the rest of the book so the website is my name paul p-a-u-l the number seven cope c-o-p-e dot com forward slash free chapters and if you go to that uh website you'll be able to download the first four chapters for free perfect i'll be putting the link in the description and you can just click it um if you uh if you don't want to type it so, Paul, thank you very much for everything that you shared with us, for being so vulnerable and so open about talking about your story and um, everything that you went through. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, Gratitude Seeker. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this interview. I really appreciate it. And if you could think of one person that would also benefit from it, share it with them. It might actually be the inspiration that they need to make their day or maybe even their life much better. Thank you so much once again. This has been Georgian Benta. Don't forget to keep seeking and spreading gratitude.